All right, so we are on the second of the Three Mothers trilogy with the Mother of Darkness, Mater Tenebrarum. So this movie is also, well, this movie is called Inferno. And I would say it's kind of a complicated piece in Argento's work because it both features the best and the worst of Argento. We're gonna start this off with the best. So this is honestly, I would argue at points even more so than Suspiria, the most beautiful of Argento's works. So just breaking it down into lighting, set design, and costuming, the lighting is intense as it is beautiful. It, you would call Suspiria subtle compared to this one. The bylighting is at its most bylightiest with its pinks and blues, especially within the first part of the movie. I would also love to say that this movie has more of a modern to ancient anachronism going on in its lighting. You have this very modern 80s intense lighting with this kind of old-fashioned subjects. Um, I would also say this extends into the set design, which also features very much modern with not modern stuff. So a really good example of this, I find, is one of the most memorable scenes in the entirety of Inferno. Um, the scene with the beautiful woman in the lecture classroom, you have this very, like, halogen sort of 80s classroom lighting with a mixture of this beautiful witch who is she's stunning and she is old-fashioned and she almost feels like she, well she definitely feels like she doesn't belong in there you have this totally utterly modern classroom with this sterile feel mixed with something gothic and something old it also especially shows in the bookseller's room at the beginning of the movie, where you have this very utterly old-fashioned kind of bookseller thing with all its wood and all its old books, and it just looks a little bit grimy and stuff like that, but it also looks very fairy tale -y. It doesn't look like what a modern bookstore would look like. It's a lot more old-fashioned, mixed with this very crisp 80s costuming in this very intense lighting. Also going into the costuming definitely comes into play this very modern 80s costuming which you found which I found was very absent for 70s sort of costuming in Suspiria. In Suspiria it's a lot more suspended in time but with this you know based on the amount of shoulder pads and just the way that everybody dresses that this is the 80s undoubtedly I would also argue that you have a lot more ambitious and intense scenes in this movie that kind of are both more terrifying and more camp so just getting into a little bit of the death scenes you have two of my favorite ones which are eaten alive by cats and eaten alive by rats. Inherently very silly sort of prospects that are just very intense and very done well, especially in that rat eating scene. It just, you can almost feel them on you. It's just, it's so visceral and squeamish that it hurts. Um, so you have this very silliness with this very serious and very honestly graphic sort of reality of the situation. I would also argue that this extends into the beginning of the movie with what I would argue is one of the best scenes of the entire movie, the pool scene, where a woman goes and falls into a giant pool of water and is suspended in there. And I, I can't even fathom the work that goes into a scene like that. You have to have the light. You have to have enough light to film underwater. You have to have these lights showing underwater you also have to have the camera work with her underwater and you have to have an actress that oh boy really 
has to hold her breath based on how long this scene is. I think it's like, I think it's like three to five minutes. It's like if you've ever held your breath before, like seriously underwater, well, of course you have. But holding your breath underwater for that long, I'm sure that there are multiple takes, but having to work with holding your breath that long is intense for everybody on set. Like, I just, I can't imagine the work that came into it. And also, once again, going into how you have the modern with the old, you have this awesome set design of this super gothic castle, castle feel and these ridiculous dummies uh, just going into how Camp Argento is with this beautiful 80s white gown and everything just kind of flowing up. You have the mixture of the modern and the costuming and the new and the old in the set design. Just, I cannot go and, I, I cannot, I cannot go and recommend this scene enough. It's just, it's so great. And this is such a great movie for visuals. Now, getting into where the film doesn't necessarily work, the plot has been described as incomprehensible. And I would agree it is utterly incomprehensible. Argento is just not known for his plots, and really, that definitely extends to his later career, where it just feels like he goes into the utterly camp and ridiculous zones more and more and more and it works less and less and less. It's really highlighted in Mother of Tears but you can definitely see it over here in Inferno. So I'm gonna summarize a little bit of this movie but fun fact about me and how I sort of run this show I actually sometimes use notes so I'm gonna have to use notes for this one because I I, I cannot remember this plot or make it work in my mind. I actually came out of this movie like thinking about the plot and going like, I don't actually know what happened in this movie, so I'm gonna have to use notes for this. Okay, so we open on the alchemist going and talking about the three mothers. We have Mother Suspiriorum, little little hint to Suspiria. Mater Tenebrarum, the mother that we're going to be dealing with now, and Mater Lacrimarum, who we're going to be dealing with in 2007's Mother of Tears. So, Mother Suspiriorum is the mother of size. Mater Tenebrarum is the mother of darkness. Mater Lacrimarum is the mother of tears. So this alchemist explains that he has made them three houses. One in Freiburg, Germany, where we met little Sophie Ban Susie Banyan. I don't know why I keep calling her Sophie. <laughs> Where we met little Susie Banyan. We are in New York now for Mater Tenebrarum. He built her a house in New York. And then for Mater Lacrimarum, she resides in Rome. So he's talking about how this goes against all of nature and it's awful and what he did is terrible and he'll never live it down. And then we are back into the bookseller's little place where he's going and selling this book to rose so rose goes and once again uh, just talking about that beautiful scene earlier falls into that manhole and has to deal with that scene and goes and writes about it to her brother mark who's at university in italy you can see how this is a fucking game of telephone and a bit of a clusterfuck so mark goes and tells his friend sarah and they start exploring it and freaky shit starts happening and then Sarah's like, I'm so scared. And she talks to her neighbor, Carlo, who's hot and they hook up and then they're killed by a masked killer. And then Mark finds their bodies and he's so sad. And then he gets that plot rolling along. And oh boy, you can see that this is just this is an utter clusterfuck. I mean, things happen and they make sense, kind of, but they're not really derived by any emotion or character motivations. It just feels like things are happening. 
and you accept that things are happening, but Lord knows they don't make any lick of sense, and we don't really get a main character to latch onto. It just feels like a series of literal unfortunate events. So, just, you could see that that plot is kind of incomprehensible, and just talking about the characters, I could not possibly tell you their names i could not remember their names after watching this fucking film i knew them as scared gal who falls into manhole mustache man the girl who's interested in mustache man and sexy neighbor <laughs> um that is all i could think about for these characters and that extends to the acting it's very hammy because that's what Argento sort of asks of its actors. And while it really worked in Suspiria and this, it also kind of works a little bit less, mostly because the stuff is a lot more big and grand. Uh, and he's asking them to ham it up a lot more. But also because I knew something about Sophie and I don't know anything about these characters. Whew, they are a mess. Um, and just going into how campy it is, there are some things that really work for the camp in its favor. Um, fun fact about this movie, it features the theme song of the Three Mothers, which if you haven't heard it, it's just fucking great. Um, it's truly, truly the best thing about this series is the fact that you have the Three Mothers theme song, um, which is both campy and ridiculous and fun, but also really takes the gravitas out of this movie when you have a goddamn theme song for these three mothers. And extending into the score, it's getting more camp. While you had, I'm not, I'm not gonna call the Goblin score subtle, but while you had more of an artistic take with the Goblin score, with this one, eh, it definitely tells you how to feel. Um, and that really extends into Mother of Tears, but we'll talk about that later. So going and giving this film a score, I'm actually going to rate this in Hot Sexy Witch Ladies. Um, and I'm going to give it three out of five Hot Sexy Witch Ladies. Um, it gets the three out of five because these visuals are ambitious and fantastic and intense and it's Argento truly at its best, but this story is just fucking terrible. This is just, this is a terrible story. This is some incomprehensible nonsense. And oh boy, it's just, this story's bad. So next week we are going to cover the conclusion of the Three Mothers trilogy. We're gonna talk about the most controversial entry in this entire movie, a movie series, The Mother of Tears, the 2000 film by Dario Argento, and what works and what, uh, what really doesn't. I am Bridget Bardot, for all you know, signing off and excited to review the last of the Three Mothers, Mothers trilogy. See ya. <laughs>